fans. These are the largest construction projects on Earth happening today to build the smallest things that have ever been built. The supply chain is going to start here and end here in the United States. Pat Gelsinger, stand up. We need to get back to work making more chips in America. Intel is this country's champion chip company. TSMC has learned to dance with 400 partners. Intel has always danced alone. <laughs> We have the most sophisticated semiconductors in the world. China doesn't. We've out-innovated China. Well, we, you mean Taiwan. Fair. How globalization enabled Taiwan and not the US to build an advanced semiconductor ecosystem, an ecosystem that have supported the US industry and military to keep a tech dominance position for over 30 years until today and why the U.S. wants to kill this globalization now in the chip industry and is suddenly considering their long collaboration with their Asian partners who are well perceiving this shift in policy as a mistake that needs to be corrected as echoed by the CEO of Intel and a national security unsafe dependence that needs to be resolved to the extent that Taiwan officials are asking U.S. counterparts to calm down this rhetoric about the unsafe chip reliance in case of Chinese invasion. Will the industrial policy adoption be enough to help the U.S. replicate Taiwan's mature semiconductor ecosystem while not bringing back failure stories of politically handpicking specific industries and companies to receive large subsidies? And what would be the future of Taiwan's political security if the U.S. succeeds and Taiwan becomes irrelevant in this critical technology? In this third episode, we will dig deeper into these points to see how the U.S. is disrupting chip globalization and free trade while sparking a global arms race for chip supremacy. A global race that is reshaping the way technology is being developed and accessed and the outcome of which will depend on the pure business dynamics of maximizing shareholders' value, offering superior global products at competitive prices, and dealing with all stakeholders fairly and ethically to maintain a global competitive edge while trying to navigate the complexities of the geopolitical standoff between the current two state models, democracy and autocracy. These companies see what I see, that the future of the chip industry is going to be made in America. The Chips and Science Act has sparked over $330 billion in investments to build the U.S. semiconductor ecosystem. Over 83 new projects across 25 states covering construction of semiconductor fabs, expansion of existing sites, R&D labs, packaging sites, and facilities that supply materials and equipment. All these projects forecast more than 47,000 new high-quality jobs within the next decade. But among all these investments by more than 40 separate entities, there is one specific company CEO that is receiving a lot of attention in the media. Pat Gelsinger is the CEO of Intel. He's a tech industry pioneer and played a key role in developing several groundbreaking technologies such as USB, Wi-Fi, and Intel's line of leading computer chips. I want to become a foundry for them just like they use TSMC today. I've talked to everybody in the industry. I want them all running on our factories because that is better for them to have more resilient supply chains and I'm going to make it a good business proposition for them as well. As the U.S. wants to make chips in America by Americans, it comes at no surprise that Intel, the local champion semiconductor company, receives the biggest subsidy ever in application of the industrial policy that the U.S. has long blamed China for adopting with its local companies, granting Intel $8.5 billion in direct funding plus $11 billion in federal loans. Today, we are announcing our intention to invest $8.5 billion in Intel, America's champion semiconductor company. That $8.5 billion investment will be the single largest grant that we make from the entire CHIPS program. And how appropriate in the American champion company.
Under the new leadership of Pat Gelsinger, Intel has made several strategic moves to rebuild its iconic history and to re-emerge as the new Western leader in providing advanced chips to the US economy, with a target to achieve 50% of the global supply chain market by 2030. And with that, I'm thrilled today to announce, simply put, Intel Foundry. This is a new organizational model for Intel that includes our three major elements, technology development, you know, our global manufacturing and supply chain, and our Intel Foundry services and ecosystem operation, all three together, Intel Foundry, a rebuilding of Intel. To realize this new business model, Intel bought the latest advanced EUV machine from ASML, called High NA EUV to be able to manufacture the most advanced chips with dimensions that can go below 2 nanometer, which is not needed currently by TSMC. Intel then adopted an aggressive plan to build factories in Arizona, New Mexico, Ohio, and Oregon, and even expand its manufacturing facilities in other parts of the world. And on the product level, Intel decided to enter the AI race with its new AI chips to compete with NVIDIA and AMD as well. I'm excited to introduce the Intel Gaudi 3 AI Accelerator for the first time. Intel Gaudi 3. However, as aggressive all these moves are, let's see how Intel business performance is actually seen by analysts and investors, especially after announcing their $7 billion loss in their new foundry business. Intel is essentially looking to convince investors that they're going to have better profitability. It plans to separate the economics of its internal fabs from its actual chip designs. But investors, as we know, just over this past year are pretty cautious, and you see that in the stock reaction. Intel shares just really are not riding that AI wave, even after recently winning roughly $20 billion in government aid and loans to build those chip hubs on American soil. And that's because near-term fundamentals are still trending flat to negative. And then you got, last but not least, the big negative that will come up today, Intel's foundry business. You're seeing on your screen Ohio right now. That's a, a, just the work for that. It's said to be losing lots of money at all their various plants, and this Ohio one is already delayed until 2027, possibly 2028, according to Pat Gelsinger. So that's adding to investor caution right now about Intel's massive turnaround plan. Pat, there were, there were so many questions on the call about your foundry business and for our global audience that's the co sort of contract manufacturing business where you make chips for others and, and, and I'm, you seem to say that you didn't get an, as many committed dollars as you thought you might and I wonder what's standing in the way of that, customers committing to backing your foundry business. Yeah, and we're very comfortable with the progress. It took us three decades to have our supply chains move to Asia. You know, what we've said is, hey, we've gone from 80-20 to 20-80 in Asia. Wow. By the end of the decade, so, you know, seven, eight years, I think we can get close to 50-50. If we accomplish that, I think the world is going to sleep much better at night. Well, as ambitious Intel's new foundry business strategy is to surpass $15 billion revenue from external customers by 2030, the analyst from JP Morgan actually highlights that TSMC would be 10x larger than Intel in their foundry revenue by that same date. TSMC founder Morris Chang took aim at Intel CEO Pat Gelsinger on Tuesday, calling him, quote, very discourteous. I've met every one of Intel CEOs, including that fellow. Five years ago, that fellow was already a bit cocky. Today, he is very discourteous toward TSMC. I deal with him the way he deals with us. But aside from Intel's own transformational challenges, the whole effort to build a semiconductor ecosystem in the United States faces its own challenges. Various reports from prestigious consulting firms and industry associations have detailed such challenges and tried to set strategies to overcome them. One of the main challenges is the lack of talented workforce necessary to build and operate the new chip fabs, with an estimate that there will be around 67,000 unfilled jobs by 2030. Why is TSMC successful in Taiwan? Because TSMC also gets good, well-trained technicians and even well-trained operators from a lot of trade schools in Taiwan. Their students only aspire to make a good living as technicians and even operators. I mean, they don't turn over, they don't leave their job as soon as there's something better, something that pays more. 
To highlight the work culture competitive advantage of Taiwan, Morris Chang said in a previous interview that when a piece of equipment broke down at 1 o'clock in the morning in the US, it would be fixed by next morning at 9. However, in Taiwan, it would be fixed by 2 a.m. As being the most critical problem identified when TSMC tried to solve it in its new Arizona fab, it led to severe tensions between Arizona labor unions and TSMC officials, filled with cultural and work style disputes that were not reported with any other chip manufacturer in the states in building their new fabs. Meanwhile, in the U.S. state of Arizona, the construction of TSMC's first American chip plant is well behind schedule. The company has blamed a skills shortage among American workers. But an Arizona union leader is firing back, saying local workers are experienced and fully qualified. According to Aaron Butler, TSMC is using the skills deficit as an excuse to bring in low-paid labor from Taiwan. Employees at the fab in Arizona are dissatisfied with the managerial style of the Taiwanese chip giant and claimed a report from the New York Times. We are encountering certain challenges as there is an insufficient amount of skilled workers with those specialized expertise required. Governor Hobbs met personally with TSMC executives in Taiwan over this weekend as her office works to make sure the project is a quote win-win for the company and Arizona workers. Taiwanese chip making giant TSMC has agreed to work with US unions, a breakthrough after months of labor disputes involving a new site. Some of the most advanced chips in the world will be made in America, but by a foreign firm, the largest chip manufacturer in the world, like you mentioned, not only getting 6.6 .6 billion in subsidies, but also $5 billion in low cost government loans. TSMC are now upping its promise to spend $65 billion with the addition of a third plant in Arizona, but some promises have already been broken. TSMC pushed back initial production at its first factory into 2025, saying local workers in the United States lacked expertise with advanced equipment. And then in January, TSMC said the second plant would not meet its original 2026 schedule as well. Obviously, it's it's you have to assume there'll be some challenges. That being said, these projects are on time. Uh, we expect them to be producing at scale two and three nanometer in the coming years. Another chip plant, though, by TSMC does pose a threat to Intel, which is the biggest recipient so far of Chipsack funding. The big problem is it going to be about following through on promises and their timelines. Both companies, TSMC and Intel, have already announced delays. Well, the irony of all of this dispute with TSMC is that the Department of Commerce published a formal report of more than 100 pages in 23 with an assessment of the microelectronics industrial base in the United States. The report covered this issue of the huge shortage in workforce talent and had two very important recommendations. One, about increasing the ability of companies in the United States to hire and retain highly skilled non-US citizens. And the other, about increasing pathways for workers in America to become American workers. So apart from this main challenge, I've listed here the top five challenges that face the United States in building its own local resilient supply chain of advanced semiconductors. And what relates to shortage of talent, global supply chain complexity, managing the costly economics of chip fabrication, maintaining the pervasiveness and ubiquity of chips, and the high geopolitical risks for Taiwan to be ever indispensable in the most advanced chip fabrication technology. If there's no war, then I think the effort to increase onshore manufacturing of semiconductors is a wasteful and expensive exercise in futility, if there's no war. If there is war, then, my goodness, we all have a lot more than just ships to worry about. Not going to be possible to turn back the clock. And uh, if you want to re-establish a complete semiconductor supply chain in the United States, you will not find that to be a possible task. It took Taiwan three decades to build its mature semiconductor supply chain ecosystem. And TSMC actually represents a super functioning cluster at the economy of scale level, and not only a mere chip manufacturing company. 
its unique management practices echoed very well with the Taiwanese culture, a culture that relied on TSMC as a geopolitical shield against the persistent fear from Chinese invasion. An invasion that's depicted by US policymakers and media as to block TSMC from the US, despite the fact that TSMC already has two fabs in China producing legacy chips and that China has hundreds of factories producing products for American firms and that the US policy is to continue trade with China but not in high-tech products. But the chip war started by the US have gone too far even for an outrageous idea of blowing up TSMC in case of Chinese invasion to be discussed in the US Congress. Chris, do you think Intel will succeed in building a foundry business that can compete with TSMC? We've seen a number of companies uh, try to do so and compete with TSMC with varying degrees of success, but certainly TSMC has vast scale uh, and advanced technologies that make it uh, difficult to, to compete with. I think there's a basic assumption we need to make that there's no war. There's no war in Taiwan Strait. There's no war between the United States and China. I certainly support that part of American industrial policy to slow down China's progress. French law does not include Taiwan. In fact, the Commerce Secretary has said repeatedly that Taiwan is a very dangerous place. We cannot, America cannot rely on Taiwan uh, for chips, and that's Secretary Raimondo. That, of course, is uh, Taiwan's uh, dilemma. It's Taiwan's dilemma indeed. First, it's a dilemma with China, which declared a whole nation stands on technology. And seeks to decouple from the US and to rejuvenate and reunify the Chinese people including those who fled China to the Formosa Island in 1949 to establish Taiwan after the Communist Party successful revolution. Second, it's a dilemma with the United States, its tech partner and military aid supporter that's suddenly adopting industrial policy and killing chip globalization, while declaring that its dependency on Taiwan has become a national security risk and it's giving opportunity for the long business rivals of TSMC to try to dethrone it and threaten Taiwan's political future by weakening its silicon shield from China. And actually, it's a dilemma for the whole world to witness such a new chapter of the developing clash between two state models that surfaced so clearly with the respective response performance to the global COVID pandemic crisis. The US liberal democratic capitalism versus the Chinese blend of state-directed capitalism and political authoritarianism or democracy versus autocracy. We are in the midst of a fundamental debate about the future and direction of our world. That autocracy is the best way forward, they argue. And those who understand that democracy is essential, and I believe that every ounce of my being, that democracy will and must prevail. We have to prove that our model isn't a relic of history. The world is undergoing changes unseen in a century, and now is the time for major development a major transformation.